And we're back. So, uh, we're going to talk in terms of tension reduction. We see with the Baumeister study that resisting cookies, hard, resisting radishes, easy. Those who got the easy task of resisting radishes had more libidinal energy to force themselves to attempt more puzzles. Right? Those who used up their libidinal energy on the cookies, man, they didn't attempt as many puzzles and they didn't work as long at it. And, and you can see the data is pretty striking. Uh, that's a pretty big effect. Right? So, this tension reduction then derives from an economic hypothesis. The instinctual drive creates the excitation or the tension that is, oh my God, I feel hungry, I really want that food, right? And you can feel the tension. I want another piece of cake. You shouldn't have another piece of cake, but I want it, right? So tension is constantly present. It doesn't go away. It just changes its form. Fluctuations in, in tension are tied to, to psychic energy in, in, invested in that drive. So the, the potency of the drive, right? then is tied to the psychic energy that's invested in satisfying that drive. So different drives come at us with different energy potentials. Uh, so the clashing of psychological forces, that is the will, the idea, the desire, the excitation, uh, cathexis in terms of like sexual desire, these are all things that are conscious to the, to the id, right? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, conscious to the ego. Uh, the unconscious, the, the counter will, if you will, comes uh, from the id. So it's the counter idea, the repression, the inhibition, uh, and, and the guilt. And, and we're caught between these two forces. Uh, and, and of course, what's the third force that we're going to describe here in a minute? The third component of, of Freud's theory? Yeah, well, so we've got ego, id so far, we're going to go to superego. So. The pleasure principle, cathexis without gratification, builds tension, creating a stage of unpleasure. Yes, a strange Freudian term. But to the extent that I have this urge and the urge is not being satisfied, right, it leads me to a greater and greater state of unpleasure. And, and this is ultimately going to drive me uh, with greater strength to attempt to fulfill that need to fulfill that drive. So the, the reduction of the instinctual drive through fantasy or, or action produces pleasure. So Freud, you know, a rich fantasy life, that is, uh, maybe someone insulted us and, and really insulted us in front of a bunch of people and I really want to get even, I want to punch their face or I want to say something back, but let's say they're higher in power than me, they're, they're my boss, right? So I have this urge and I have this urge to get even, I have this urge to strike out, but it will be counterproductive, the cost will be too high. So, I inhibit this urge, and then later on, I engage in the fantasy of actually carrying out my drive. And that then re reduces some of the tension that's built up as a result of not allowing the drive to take place. So, this reduction of unpleasure is the pleasure principle. Now, if it's sexual tension, that is, if I want to have sex, then, then having sex, right, uh, is one way to, if I want to eat, then, then eating would be one way to reduce this unpleasure and, and then uh, move into a state of pleasure. So, uh, the pleasure principle then says we're motivated, motivated to achieve tension-free state of pleasure. And, and this could also be described then as the presence of unpleasure. Freud had this issue of why do people do things, right? And we represent them as either pleasurable or unpleasurable. This is tied to our instincts. So we seek to move, we seek to get up off the couch, we seem to become more active as a result of trying to reduce the sense of unpleasure by fulfilling that need or drive. Okay. But some drives are inappropriate altogether or inappropriate under certain circumstances. And here again comes the tension because there's opposing forces that say, no, you can't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. The parents, the school, the church, our, our society in general, right? Law tells us that certain things are off limit. Just because they're off limits doesn't mean that we don't want to do them. So notice, as social animals, we're thrust into this tension creating dynamic. So, what can we do? Well, repression. We, we have the process of forgetting information experienced by the ways that are unconscious. So, repression is the ego's counterforce for the id's demanding desire. And the id says, do it, do it, you want it. And, and, and then the ego says, no, 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 can't, no. That it tries to repress this 
drive. And it can probably su successfully repress the drive in the short term. But Freud is saying over the long term, as we repress it, we're stuffing this information back down into the unconscious. It hasn't gone away, and Freud is going to warn us that it might manifest itself in some other way. Right? Now, suppression is the process of removing the thought from attention by ways that are conscious, intentional, and deliberate. So we try to distract ourselves. We try to think of something else. Uh, and notice so that this is we're moving away from the drive. We're not removing the drive. So, so maybe suppression can be thought of in, in those terms. Big question that's kind of, you know, a, a nasty question for Freudians and, and people who subscribe to psychodynamic theory. Do the id and the ego uh, actually exist? Well, again, when we look at Freud's theory a hundred years later, and, and, but we look at research that's been done over the last 50 or 60 years, we can kind of cherry pick uh, ideas, theories that demonstrate that maybe Freud wasn't that far off. Uh, but remember, now we're hypothesizing essentially after the results are known, probably not the best uh, way to get at it. But let's, let's just be generous. The limbic system makes for a pretty fair id. Uh, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the amygdala, the medial forebrain bundle, right? The, the pleasure, uh, unpleasure brain centers, all these limbic structures are largely outside of conscious control outside of conscious awareness. They make their, their ideas known to the conscious, but they might make a pretty fair id. Now the neocortex right up front here uh, makes for pretty fair ego. So learning, memory, decision making, intellectual problem solving, maybe in the form of cost benefit analysis, which is prefrontal cortex, uh, executive control center, perceives the world, learns to adapt to it. So we have these two areas of the brain that represent conscious control, inhibitory powers, right? And then we have the deep limbic structures that really represent the drives and kind of the reactive uh, style of living. So uh, you could make a case, right, that if you wanted to represent the id in, in the ego, it's largely the limbic system. And if you want to represent the ego, then it's largely prefrontal cortex and, and higher level uh, processes. The, the intricate, intricately interrelated neural pathways and structures, the neocortex and the limbic system, right, uh, allow these two to communicate. But we know that there's a certain directionality. We know that the amygdala has a huge number of projections to all these different areas, parts of the brain, whereas the projections, the connections to the amygdala from the other areas of the brain are fewer. So the amygdala has kind of an advantage of pushing its agenda and the rest of the brain, the higher level brain, communicating back to the amygdala doesn't have necessarily the same potency. But regardless, Freud's ideas are not completely unsupported. Uh, they just often are not amenable to empirical testing because they tend to be more philosophical, theoretical. Uh, so with that being said, let's move uh, into a kind of a, a more modern view of psychodynamic processes. And, and let's talk about Levinger and, and his idea of ego development. And, and what he's talking about is a six stage process that we move through. And this isn't necessarily tied to age as, as clearly, but obviously it's going to proceed with age. But when we look at Piaget, when we look at Freud, when we look at Erickson, they were pretty specific about putting numbers on these. We can be a little more flexible here. In the symbiotic stage, what we are is we're, for example, this, this is our relationship with mom, if you will. And I'm talking under average circumstances. So this is breastfeeding, this is being held, this is being changed, clean, symbiotic. So we are basically an organism that's attached to another organism, not quite in a parasitic fashion. Some parents would like get upset about that term, but let's face it, that the, uh, the fetus is essentially parasitic on, on the mother, and then the fetus, uh, as it becomes a newborn, an infant, it has no capacity to do anything for itself, so it operates in symbiosis with its, with its caregiver. Now, as we start breaking loose and we start to 
develop a sense of self and we become an independent being, then we see operating in the impulsive level. And this is really kind of akin to the toddler stage, is toddlers try to do all kinds of shit, right? And, and you know, the, the, the word that we probably employ the most when we're dealing with toddlers is no. Because they're impulsive, they want, they want, they want, they're these little id creatures that want, right? but they don't have any higher order function to put the brakes on, no, you can't. So we do it for them, right? Now, when we become self-protective, this is when we develop this sense of self, and this would be a higher level, and we seek to protect that sense of self. So, in part, it's a largely conceptual kind of self-schema that we're trying to, uh, to, to cover for. Now, the conformist, we learn the rules of society and we want to be like everyone else, right? So that's where the average Joe kind of gets through the conformist stage. What's everyone else doing? What are they wearing? Let's hang out with those people. And then finally, the next two stages, right? The conscientious is we start to develop a value system and some people don't do this. A lot of people out there in the world don't operate on the basis of values. They operate on the basis of what they believe what they think society thinks they should do. Right? The conscientious then develop their own values, they start thinking about life and their place in the world, and, and they try to stay true to themselves. And then the autonomous is kind of like the full-blown, if you will, and we'll talk about this down the road, especially in the next one, when we look at positive psychology, when we talk about the humanists, this would be a, a conscious attempt at self-actualization, or uh, if we look at the existentialist, this is developing authenticity, which interestingly, uh, or not interestingly, will be the topic of your last at-home activity. More on that later. So, Levenger is, is trying to show us that, that we can move through these stages, right, which is really to kind of typify the relationship we have with ourselves and with society, and the average Joe usually hits just about the conformist stage, and that's about as good as they get. So, ego development, according to Levenger, can be construed as a process. It's uh, something that we move through, and, and we can see that some people have relatively stunted development. Some people have a problem. They, they say whatever the hell pops into their mind, right? They're cruel to others. They don't think about how they operate. They seek pleasure at the expense of others. Right? So you can make a case that, that many people maybe kind of sit at the impulsive stage. Uh, and according to Levenger, this is kind of representative of ego uh, development that, that stopped, uh, didn't continue. So this process of ego development if you've ever heard the statement, I am a work in progress, are you a work in progress? That is, will I improve over time? Will I move closer and closer to self-actualization? Right? And the ego guides our perception of in response to the world around us. So it's this strong ego development that kind of then determines our relationship to people in our lives, and to the environment, right? you know. I may want to do this, I may want to throw my trash on the ground, and as I look out in front of my house, there's people who just walk around and say, I'm not using this trash anymore, I will throw it on the ground. Uh, and these are adults, but their ego development is right here, right? Uh, and, and, and we see that, hey, it's bad to litter, well, I don't want to be a litter bug, so a lot of advertisements would use, don't litter, don't be a litter bug, right? And they coin that term litter bug to get people to conform a stage not to litter. The impulsive people, the only way you're going to get them is probably to threaten them with some kind of severe sanction. So, Ego then is a process, guides the way we respond to our world. So, motivational importance of ego development, the ego develops to defend against anxiety, and that is, we make some, many of us make some tough choices, but then we compliment ourselves on making those tough choices. Boy, I really wanted to do that, but boy, I really thought it was wrong. A strong ego development lets me stand up and say, you know, I'm making a choice, and even though it kind of makes me sad that I didn't do it, uh, big picture, I'm happy because I was able to inhibit myself. Uh, I'm not an animal, I'm a human being, and I have some measure of control over how I behave. Right? And notice how that's a higher level reward. That's a reward that's moving away from the satisfaction of a drive to satisfying a concept of who one is. And that's a big jump. And a lot of people won't make it 
through their entire lifespan. Right? So the ego develops to empower the person to interact more effectively and more proactively with his surroundings. And, and again, you can see concepts like self-efficacy build into this. You can talk about self-regulation and the people who are highly self-regulated because they believe it's the right thing to do. They believe it's being consistent with themselves as we go back to your self-regulation paper. Now, ego defense, changes in internal or external reality. Okay, that, that we have, we live in a fluid world, right? And there might be environmental dangers, conflict with the environment. Uh, there might be instinctual presses from the id. The id says, oh my God, do you really want this? Do you want to do this? And then there might be super ego demands, that part of us, the third part that Freud referred to, that is our learned behavioral scripts, that is what is okay and what is not, according to the church, according to society, according to our parents, and to the extent our ego development proceeds to autonomy, that is the rules that we have crafted for and chosen to abide for ourselves, right? So that would be the superego demands, and the superego is, in fact, if you will, uh, could be relabeled conscience. Right. So, uh, changes into the external or external reality can, can, can put these dangers into uh, consciousness. The defense mechanisms are used to buffer or reduce anxiety. So if I really want a cigarette, but I say smoking is bad for you, that's one way to get at it, right? How do I not then smoke and then how do I deal with the anxiety of not smoking? Well, I institute some kind of defense mechanism. But let's suppose I lose the battle on this cigarette. I say I shouldn't smoke, I do smoke. I might say something, I might rationalize it, which would be a defense mechanism. And I say, but it's only one cigarette. It's not like I'm, I'm smoking the whole pack. I didn't stick the pack in my mouth and smoke them all in a big cloud. You know, it's just one cigarette, no big deal, right? And this would work to minimize my anxiety or my distress or depression, especially when I'm going counter to rules that I've set for myself. Right? So, then, what we see is uh, men with total life stress scores, this is a percent of the sample depressed, right? These are men with total life stress scores of less than 21. Uh, the likelihood of depression is a function of life stress and the maturity level of one's defense mechanisms. So the, the higher the level of uh, our defense mechanisms, they buffer us. This is the use of adaptive defenses, you can see. The more one uses adaptive defenses, the less depression and distress that one may encounter. The downside is in the defense mechanisms is one might argue that we're just simply fooling our, ourselves in this regard. So, effectiveness, motivation, then defined. Well, uh, it's a tendency to explore, influence one's environment, arises from experiences that demonstrates one competence. It's central to, to, to competence motivation theory. Uh, we move toward domains where we demonstrate competence and mastery. That is, we prefer to operate in areas where we do well, and we avoid areas where we don't do as well. This derives from, from, from feedback we receive beginning in childhood. So we'll pick and choose the domains in which we operate where we believe, based on our past experience, we will be most successful. Okay. We've got a break here. Uh, we got uh, about a half dozen more slides, but we do have to break here because I have a Zoom meeting, uh, so I'm just kind of doing all this stuff together. Come back for part three, please.